Welcome to Global Perspectives. How does one turn a love for food, wine, and culture into a fabulous career? Alpana Singh has quite a story to share. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator, John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Alpana. Thank you for having me. We'll talk about food and wine and all of that, but take us back to the beginning of when you used to think about things such as life, careers, and <laughs> things like that. What, what were the influences on you, and, and to what extent are those still there today? Well, um, my parents are immigrants. Uh, my parents are from the Fiji Islands, and they, my great-grandparents uh, came from India to Fiji uh, during the late 1800s indentured laborers. My grandparents and parents were born in Fiji. Um, my parents migrated to the U.S. in the 70s, and then I was born and raised in Monterey, California. And so the sort of that dual role of being a child of immigrants, but growing up very American, I think, has shaped a lot of who I am as a person. You know, having that sort of immigrant perspective of work ethic and family and, you know, just sort of, uh, you know, just like really just this very strong work ethic. And then, but also having that sense of, you know, being very much an American and having sort of those dreams as an American and, my parents uh, settled in uh, in hospitality careers. My dad was uh, working for Pebble Beach Corporation. My mother was a, a waitress. And so I grew up with restaurant chatter in the background. But my future was very much determined to not involve restaurant work. And my future was to get a college degree and go into a profession such as medicine, you know, or law or something like that. Um, and then in high school, I started working at Baker Square. My first job was a hostess at Baker Square. And then I did that to, you know, just my after school job. And then I started working at this really nice fine dining restaurant in college. And then that's where I learned about wine. So there was a a little bit of a culture shock between me and my parents when I told them that I wanted to not pursue a formal education but study to become a master sommelier, which is how I found out about it. And for my very hardworking Indian parents, it was, uh, you know, not a happy moment for them because they wanted me to have a solid foundation of a solid education and, you know, dropping out of college to go pursue something as lofty as the Court of Master Sommeliers, which has a 3% pass rate, just seemed not very stable. And you were also very young. I was very young at the same time as well, and so I found out about the Master Sommelier program when I was 19, so yes, not old enough to drink, um, but it was a dream that I had, and I was determined, and I was very driven, and so I set up a, a plan to make it happen. Tell us just briefly exactly what happened for those who may not know you did something really amazing so and you've secured your place <laughs> in wine history thank you thank you so the master sommeliers is an organization that certifies individuals in the service and hospitality of wine there are roughly around 140 master sommeliers in the united states 27 worldwide who are women so you go and you take this exam that involves service theory as well as a blind tasting. So it's the identification of six wines, the country, the vintage, the grape variety in 25 minutes. And you know, it's an, an extremely impossible exam to, to pass. Um, but like I said, I was, I was driven and I was very focused. So I became the youngest woman to ever pass the exam um, at the age of 26. And I'm sure people were shocked. I, yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I was so, like, in the pursuit of it. You know, I'm 40 now, and, you know, I, I proctor exams. And even I'm sort of blown away, you know, when I watch candidates go through it and they take the exam and, we you know, the knowledge and the information that's required. You know, you have to be able to talk effectively about really any wine in the world and then also spirits and, you know, distilled beverages and things like that. But even I was just sort of like, wow, if I could only get that attention span back to be able to study and absorb that information. So, yes, I mean, and that's a nice thing to do to be able to kind of look back and, and be really appreciative of something that you've accomplished. Well, what has that meant in terms of your career, having this mastery of, of wine? Because you've been in the restaurant business, you've done a TV show, and on and on. It seems like it would probably crop up in all of them. <laughs> well, it's very settling um, for yourself as a person to, to have a goal and to pursue it and to achieve it. But you realize that it's so also not about you and what it means to other people and how it inspires other people. And so it's been a, an extremely you know, humbling thing for me to have other people that come to me and say, I read about you, I heard that you pursued this exam, and being a, a female, being a minority, 
you know, have, coming from a non-traditional wine background, you know, my parents didn't drink wine when I was growing up, you know, and then having them be inspired to pursue it themselves or pursue a career in wine, you know, it's very humbling, you know, and I never thought when I first started this that other people would use me as an example or as, or as a beacon to do something for themselves. And so for me, it's meant a great deal. But when I take into account of how it's inspired other people, I mean, it's really, you know, it makes it all worth it, all the sacrifice that I had to do to get through it. Talk to us about the sort of Indian, Fiji, American influences, <laughs> especially in, in, in your cuisine. And you, know, you own two restaurants, I believe, in Chicago. Three. Three. Yeah. three. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm a little bit behind. <laughs> right. And you'll have to tell me about the third one. But um, how does all of that influence your planning, your organization, the menus, and so forth? Well, you know, I was exposed to, you know, Indian food is very exotic. And it's, you know, really in depth when it comes to like textures and flavors and different spices and the heat level. And I learned to cook from a very early age. But I think being exposed to all of those different flavors really helped me build my sense of taste. Um, but you know, food is something that really galvanizes all of us. You know, we all have fond memories, at least I hope we all have fond memories of, you know, meals with our family and, you know, it's that sense of open you know, openness and it fosters a sense of community. You know, you may not understand some, some cultural things that other, you know, groups may do, but we can all come together at the table. And I firmly believe that you really can't appreciate it. Well, well, what, well, let me rephrase that. It really helps you appreciate another culture when you sit down at their dinner table and you break bat bread and you exchange information. And so I, I would say that sometimes, you know, with, with, you know, political, you know, differences, I feel like maybe if we all had dinner, <laughs> you know, and, and discussed it that way, you know, we could learn a lot about each other. And that's the thing that I appreciate about food. What would be an example of an Indian influence on a dish at one of the restaurants you own? Well, we don't have um, Indian specific dishes um, at any of the restaurants per se. Um, but actually, no, I take that back. There is one dish. We have a cauliflower dish with turmeric butter, which so turmeric that. is used quite a bit in Indian food. And there's this definite sort of Middle Eastern, you know, Indian sort of like nuance to it. Um, but I think, like I said, being exposed to things like ginger and curry and different types of spices has really helped me, you know, in, in terms of my, my, my wine palate. Because that, that sort of, you know, familiar sort of thing of like, oh, I get a lot of spices in this wine. I was told that that cauliflower dish is wonderful, by the way. It's so, really tasty. So now yes. I'm, I'm looking forward to trying it. Um, I, I noticed you also had polenta on one yes, of the- Yes, polenta's great. Uh, and, and that's something I've been eating for a long time. When, when you choose something like that, how, how does it work into the decision making? Do, do you have, is it something you've tried and you wanted to add to the menu or it's something- Well, the chef comes up the with chef it. Comes up so with the chef comes up with it. So the chef comes up with it. And so I, I work with uh, three very talented chefs across three restaurants. And you know they, they come up with a dish and then I try every single dish that before it goes on the menu. And so I don't really edit the chef and, and say, hey, listen, you know, I want paella, so just make it happen. Um, you know, I work with the chef and it's a collaborative, you know, uh, thing. And I just give my feedback, you know, because my palate is trained for balance and wine, I try to help them out with the dish. And so I'll just suggest little tweaks and changes. Like, for example, that polenta dish, when I first tried it, it has the bechamel at the bottom with the, the polenta fries and then an egg. And it was just all these rich, heavy flavors. And so my contribution to the dish was it needs acid just to brighten it up. And so the chef created a little salad, a little vinaigrette, just to kind of freshen and lighten the palate. So balance is very important. Tell us how you went from wine to the television business <laughs> and then into restaurants. And, and uh, the, the show was called Check, Check Please? Check Please, correct, yes. So uh, the show came along, uh, which is a PBS show. Uh, it was a show called Check Please where we take three average people and not restaurant critics, I should say, not average, but three non-professional uh, people. And they each recommend a restaurant and everybody switches and then comes back and talks about it. So I moderated the conversation. 
the show had already been in its second season and the third season they needed a new host and so they called me and they said hey listen you know we'd love for you to audition and so I did and I ended up getting the job so I did that while also keeping my day job and so uh, I really enjoyed it just because you know Chicago is so diverse in terms of food diverse I mean the food that you get I mean it's you get everything from a hot dog to a linea and then everything else in between and so what I appreciated most about the show was that it encourage people to visit the different neighborhoods in Chicago, to explore Chicago, to get outside their comfort zone and, you know, try Senegalese food on 63rd and Halstead, you know, or to go into like Bronzeville and check out a restaurant that they saw. You know, there, there, there's nothing more motivating sometimes than like you're sitting at home and you're seeing this delicious food, you know, on your television screen. You're like, I want to go there. And then you get in your car or you get on the train and you go visit and you go patronize these mom and pop restaurants and, you know, really support the neighborhood, support the business and get a great meal out of it at the same time. And so that was the transition there. Um, and then the transition from, you know, working for somebody else to working for myself, well, that was the call of the entrepreneur. And it was a very scary call at first because, you know, running your own business, especially opening a restaurant is like, I don't know if this is such a good idea, but it was something that I knew I had to do. I had to pursue my own joy. So I decided to take the leap and open a restaurant. And then that was five years ago, and now I have three. <laughs> so tell us about the first one. What, what was the biggest challenge in setting up that operation? Hmm, there were a lot of challenges at the boarding house. Uh, the chef, it was just the managing of the business and then just learning how to manage a business. The chef, unfortunately, we had to let go of in the first few months. He was a, a wonderful person, but just was not right for the scope of the business. But really, the challenges are always going to be there. The thing that I've learned in the last five years is adapting to the changes. You know, what we entrepreneurs call the pivot. It's understanding the challenges and then giving yourself maybe 10 seconds to cry about it, but then taking that opportunity to fix it. And you have to just do that on a daily basis, you know, and so the challenges are always there. I think I've become better at handling them. Because the, <laughs> the average person who comes to one of your restaurants just sees the, you know, being well, the, on, yes. on, 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 the, mean, on the served side and then and all of the complexities no, are invisible. No, no, it's not the customer's job to worry about that. You know, like there's, uh, there, I, I say that there's two curtains you know, on a daily basis in, in the theater that we run. You know, the first curtain is when employees walk into the building. So they shouldn't be privy to things that the challenge of the business is facing. The second curtain, of course, is when customers walk in, but we're all on stage. And so the customer's coming in and restaurants are an escape for people. It's a, it's a suspending reality. You know, like we're all bombarded on a daily basis. You're like, okay, I want to escape. And that's the beauty and magic of restaurants. You walk in and you forget about your troubles for the two hours, hopefully, that you're there. Our job is to not add to the troubles. And so we are called upon to make sure that we execute things flawlessly. And we don't always get it right. You know, we mess up and it bothers me when we mess up. You know, but, you know, we don't intentionally try to do a bad job. And, you know, the stakes are very high. You know, you want to make sure that you're celebrating somebody's birthday or anniversary or special occasion or whatever it may be. You want to make sure that the guest feels cherished and taken care of. And that is to make sure that we don't make our problem their problem. As you were saying, uh, entrepreneurship is difficult. The restaurant business is particularly difficult. Yes. And when did you feel it was the right time to make the move to open a second restaurant? Well, you want to make sure that the first place is stable, you know, and so we, you know, we, we, we dealt with the challenges, you know, we addressed them, we fixed them, and then the opportunity came up. It, it's usually based on there's a space available, there's a deal available, whatever it may be, but it was just sort of like, okay, you almost become addicted to the drama and then the drama subsides and you need a fresh hit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we're like, let's do it again. And you know, with this third restaurant that we just opened uh, called Terran Vine in Evanston, um, which is a suburb right beyond Chicago, you know, I'm not gonna lie. I'm like, why do I keep doing this to myself? I was just gonna ask you that question. <laughs> That's in a very, very short period of time. <laughs> Why do I keep doing it? But then, you know what happens is it starts stabilizing, you know, it starts like running smoothly, and then all of a sudden one day you look up and you're like, everything's fine. Time to turn it over again. 
And so then you start looking for the other spot. So um, I don't want to use the word addictive, but you do become very much drawn to the energy and the upheaval. The boarding house seemed to have a very eclectic menu from the beginning, and correct, your second yes. restaurant seems to be like Amer American, American correct, Fair. Yes. What, what's the third one so, about? So um, Seven Lions, the second one, is right across the street from the Art Institute in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We serve, you know, it's it's based on the needs of the neighborhood, which is a lot of pre-theater, power and lunch crowd, things like that. Um, Terran Vine is actually our first genre specific, and that's Italian Mediterranean. And so I wanted to try my hand at something that was very cuisine specific. So it's Italian, so trying my hand at Italian. What, what's on the menu that may be different from what you typically find at an Italian restaurant, or what is called an Italian restaurant here, which often is not like the ones no, there? No, no, correct, correct. So we, it's, our, it's a lighter, fresher interpretation of Italian, and so we don't have like the, as much as I enjoy things like eggplant parmesan and spaghetti and meatballs and things like that. So this is a fresher take, and so we have, um, you know, for example, instead of like a classic chicken piccata, we do something that's inspired by it with a little bit of twist with orzo and spinach, and then there's some capers in the sauce, but it's just a bit lighter and fresher. Uh, we do these things called pizzettes instead of pizzas, and pizzettes are smaller pizzas, uh, so that way you don't have to choose. Of like, I really want pizza, I want the flavor, and I want to get a taste of it, but I also want to enjoy, you know, other items on the menu. Uh, but within that, our pizzettes have non-traditional toppings. So we'll, instead of like, you know, your margaritas and things like that, which we're happy to do, we have pear and prosciutto, or we do like chicken and pesto. Um, you know, we have another one that, you know, we experiment with, with braised short rib. So it's just, you know, things are just a little different. I have to ask you this question because it affects me, me personally. I've, I've noticed the proliferation of gnocchi dishes. Yes. Uh, even at non-Italian places, and many of them yeah. don't know what they're doing. No. And it's a very heavy, often unpleasant experience. Yes. So I was wondering, it, the gnocchi does not have to have potato in it necessarily. It can have other ingredients, Correct. and it makes. Well, you were talking about lighter fare. I was wondering, did you have you experimented with we, gnocchi? Whenever I've done things like risotto or gnocchi, unless the chef knows exactly what it's doing, you know, these are not dishes that sometimes are conducive to high volume environments. And so, with gnocchi, we op when we opened the restaurant, we had gnocchi on the menu, but we just couldn't execute it and we got complaints on it, rightfully so. They were too heavy, they were too doughy, they were too greasy. So we quickly took it off the menu. But you do have to make you know, those decisions of if we can't serve it properly and in the spirit of the dish and to honor the dish properly, then we don't do it. You know, and quite often in Italian food, that comes down to pasta being overcooked. You know, so it has to be the right al dente quality to it. Another one could be risotto which gets too gummy or the rice breaks down. Um, so, you know, risotto is something that, you know, it, you have to respect the, you have to respect the dish. And, and the challenge when you're doing genre specific food is you have to respect the culture. You know, you really do. So when you're saying you're doing Italian food, you have to make sure that you honor what this is. You know, this is somebody's history. This is somebody's legacy. This is, you know, sort of a familial attachment. You know, you don't want to bastardize the cuisine. You want to make sure that you honor and respect it. So I feel the duty very much so that when we do present a dish that we're honoring and respecting, you know, what that dish means. Do you sample everything that's everything. being introduced? Okay, I, yes. I thought so. But that's good. <laughs> I mean, you want to know and what the customers. The other thing is, I'll come in and I'll order it and tell them, don't tell them it's me. So to spot check the dish to make sure that you're doing quality. Are control. you in disguise for this? No, no, they just know the bartenders <laughs> know. I'll sit at the bar. I'm like, hey, can you order a couple things for me? But I do that on a daily basis. Every time I'm in, I'm like, doo -doo -doo, can you order this? And then I'll check it and then I'll just make sure it's quality control. But I want to make sure that they know that it's not for me because I want to see how the dish would come for a customer. And, you know, people have off times, you know, that, you know, it's just the hardest thing to nail down in a restaurant is consistency. And that's what matters to a customer, you know, and because they want to make sure that if I'm coming in, that it's the same time that I had it last time. You know, let's just say like, oh, my God, I got to take it to this place. They have the most amazing, you know, steak or whatever it is. They want to make sure that they bring their friends in and they're going to spend the money again, that it was just as good as the last time they had it. And that consistency is very important. You know, I'll take two-star food, but I'll want, I want four-star consistency. And that's very difficult. You talked about the addictive nature of the restaurant business. Do you stop at three, or do you have a goal in mind? Are you thinking about five, or, or <laughs> an empire, you know, perhaps? I stop when I feel like we're not doing a good job. 
you know, that's when I stop, you know, and but you have to make sure that your infrastructure grows along with you. But if I feel like I'm spread too thin or I feel like the quality is slipping or I feel like we're just not doing a good job and I feel like the customers are suffering, I feel like employees are suffering because we're not providing the ad adequate infrastructure, that's how you know, you know, it's time to stop. And I, I'm going to be very specific if we do decide to do a fourth because from what everybody's told me it's the number three to number four that is the biggest jump because you do outgrow your infrastructure and so you have to just make sure that you know you have the perf you know the right hiring in place maybe a director of operations more oversight maybe you hire um, you know uh, somebody to you know do things that you can't do mm -hmm. but it's just making sure that when you grow that you grow properly it's very important you reference several hard decisions you've had to make, such as the chef situation Correct, with your yes. first ref restaurant. How do you go through the process of reconciling with yourself what you're going to do, especially when you have to do something that's going to be hard on a person or people? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. It's like um, I remember being let go of, of a job, and I remember, you know, the gentleman who, let, who fired me said, um, it's not personal, it's just business. And I really never understood what that meant until I was now the person having to make that decision. And it's just what it is. It's not personal. It's just business. And the way you reconcile it is, I apologize. This unfortunately did not work out. But when you have the weight of an entire work staff on your shoulders, the livelihood of 200 employees, you realize that it's not just about you, that the decision needs to be made to protect everyone and even the person that you're letting go of and so I try to have you know that heart to heart of like listen this isn't the end of the road for you and it's the way you handle it like it didn't work out for me you know or us here but there's another path for you and I try to remind them of what their skill set is this is what you're good at this is where we didn't match up I don't want to hold you back because it's clearly not working for us but you know we try to have that conversation of maybe perhaps a situation like this would be better for you but this is where, you know, so you just try to make sure that, you know, your side of the street is clean and you just do it in a, in a morally proper way. It's interesting to me that you had not planned to go into the food business, but did <laughs> and have, have, have done great. In fact, you, you've had multiple careers and you're still very young. Is there something else that you can imagine yourself doing or, or is it going to be food for the duration? You know, I, I think food for right now, but I think we all, you know, all successful people, not all successful, but many, many, many successful people end up in the final sort of challenge and that's philanthropy. It's giving back. And that has become more important to me the older I've gotten. The further along in my career I go, you know, I realize in order for me to keep it, I have to give it away. So whether that's through mentorship, community involvement, working with charities, you know, my civic, you know, outreach. Um, I'm involved with a number of organizations back in Chicago. Uh, there's a women's shelter that I work with called Deborah's Place. I sit on the board of our, our tourism board to Chicago. I'm also involved with the Illinois Restaurant Association. And so it's my civic endeavors that really you know, have become more important to me as well, just to give back, especially to a city that's given so much to me. You, you mentioned that it's such a diverse city, and, and I agree with you. And what, what about the Indian American component specifically? We, we've been watching Indian Americans come more and more to the forefront in terms yeah. of business, politics, and everything else. Are you seeing that in Chicago, and are you involved in that community? Oh, very much. Indians are very politically <coughs> active, extremely politically active. And I think, you know, I didn't really appreciate it until I started studying more about Hinduism and there are basic core tenets of what it means to be a good Hindu and one of them is it's your duty and obligation to pursue your calling you know to do what is what's called your 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 dharam, like to follow what is your calling you know and another aspect is is really to to do right by society to do better for others to to give back and to pursue that um, you know so we're also obligated to pursue success you know, that's a, it's a very important thing for Indians to pursue success and education, philanthropy, you know, things of that nature. But it's, you know, your work and then your karma as well, which is to give back to the community. And that is done usually in civic endeavors, you know, to take care of others, you know, and to do right, to do well, and to give back. Well, thank you, Alpana Singh, thank for you. joining <laughs> us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.